Good evening. If you're just logging on, we want to welcome you to the program this evening. We're going to give it just a couple of minutes and make sure everyone has a chance to log on. The chat feature is open. If you want to give a message, say hello to anybody, any of us, we'd love to hear from you. The Q&A button is available if you have questions. I see there's already one question. If you have questions that came up when you were watching the film, go ahead and post them now. Thank you. Hi, if you're just logging on, we're just gonna give it a minute or two longer, uh, make sure everyone has a chance to log on. Uh, the chat feature is open if you wanna give a message as the Q&A is also open for your questions. Thank you. See, there are people from all over the country, which is really spectacular. Me. All right, I think we'll get started. Um, we want to keep uh, keep going on a timely. In a timely fashion, we've got Stephanie Deutsch from uh, DC, so it's getting late in her part of the world. <laughs> My name is Judy Margles. I'm the executive director at the Oregon Jewish Museum and Center for Holocaust Education. I want to welcome everyone. I do want to extend special thanks to our guest speakers, Stephanie Deutsch and Julius McGee. Really glad that they're joining us this evening for a discussion of the film Rosenwald, a remarkable story of a Jewish partnership with African American communities. But before I fully introduce our guests and turn to the program, I want to extend my gratitude to our program co-sponsors, United in Spirit. This is a cooperation between the Jewish Federation of Greater Portland, the NAACP, Dialogues Unlimited, Remember the Hope Christian Fellowship, and the Vancouver Avenue First Baptist Church. I do want to do a shout out for to Rachel Nelson at the Jewish Federation and Gail Mandel at the museum for their help in putting together tonight's program. At the Oregon Jewish Museum and Center for Holocaust Education, we offer all of our virtual programming, including this event and recordings of past events without charge. We'd be grateful for any donation you might be able to make to help us or any of our partner organizations. So I know, I hope all of you have seen the film and I'm sure you're gonna agree with me that Julius Rosenwald's biography, it just reads as a classic American success story. His German Jewish immigrant roots, his German, sorry, his German Jewish immigrant father started as a peddler. As a youth, Julius worked in his father's clothing business. He was a high school dropout, and yet he went on to become the chair of Sears Roebuck, making it at the time the largest retailer in the world. He was also a fiercely devoted philanthropist, as you could see in the film. Perhaps most remarkably, he recognized that the way black people were treated in the United States was no better than the treatment of Jews who were subjected to anti-Jewish pogroms in Russia. And he used his, his considerable wealth and capacity to raise money to build schools for black children in the American South, to build museums, YMCAs, YWCAs, housing projects, and a special fund to support black artists and writers, including photographer Gordon Parks, W.B. Du Bois, artist Jacob Lawrence, 
writers James Baldwin and Ralph Ellison, poet Langston Hughes, singer Marian Anderson, and dancer Catherine Dunham. If you choked up at the point in the film where Marian Anderson sang America the Beautiful at the National Mall, I did it both times I saw this film, you might appreciate a really quick story about a young Mark Hatfield who would go on in Oregon to become a United States Senator in the 1980s. When he was a law student at Willamette University in the 1940s, he was part of a group that brought Marian Anderson and Paul Robeson to perform. After the concert, he was tasked to drive them both back to Portland to stay overnight at the Golden West Hotel, the only hotel in the state open to black people. And then as a state legislator in 1953, Hatfield managed the passage of a public accommodations ban bill, which barred such discrimination. I'm sure you realized from the film, Rosenwald was a remarkably self-effacing man. I so loved the film clip where he said, don't be fooled by believing because a man is rich that he is necessarily <laughs> smart. I know that our discussion this evening is going to underscore this and all of his many accomplishments, but it's also going to really in this glare of the current and unprecedented movement for racial justice, delve into the, delve into the more complicated issue of how wealth is used to help the greater good. Our format for the evening, it's going to be simple. I'm going to engage with some questions with our panelists and then open up the conversation for your questions. I hope you're all familiar at this point with the Q&A tab on the Zoom and just go ahead and put your questions in there. So I'm going to first introduce our guests. Stephanie Deutsch, who of course was featured prominently in the film, was born in Washington, D.C. She grew up as the daughter of a foreign service officer. Um, she was in New Zealand and in France, as well as Arlington, Virginia. Stephanie Deutsch graduated from Brown University, has a master's degree in Soviet Union area studies from Harvard. So but despite her foreign experience, she really discovered this great love of American history. And this resulted in her book, You Need a Schoolhouse, Booker T. Washington, Julius Rosenwald, and the Building of Schools for the Segregated South. She has the, told her story, the story of the collaboration between Booker T. Washington and Julius Rosenwald in many settings, restored Ro Rosenwald schools, public, private, and charter schools, community centers, churches, and now by Zoom. I think this is your first Zoom presentation, yes? Mm, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> there you go. Julius McGee is an assistant professor at Portland State University in the Toulon School of Ur Urban Studies and Planning and the Black Studies Department. His scholarship focuses on the relationship between social inequality and climate change. He has also published on topics related to organic farming, renewable energy, global urban development, and transportation. His most recent work explores how mass incarceration contributes to climate change. Most recently, Julius McGee has embarked on a book project that explores the connection between anti-Black racism and, climate, and the climate crisis. So I do want to welcome you profusely and warmly this evening. Thank you. Julius, I'm gonna ask you first, just to take some time, if you will, to describe the current um, the historical context and what life was like in the early 20th century. Yeah, so I was, while I was watching the film, I kind of had this thought about, you know, Julius Rosenwald and I was like, man, this guy was up against a lot as far as what, uh, what black folks were facing in the South in the early 20th century. So just before we get to the 20th century, I mean, just kind of lay the groundwork and the context. Um, so, you know, the way in which um, the education of Black folks in the South was understood at the time was sort of still in the aftermath of the Nat Turner's Rebellion of 1831. No one's familiar with that. I would highly recommend looking it up, but I'll just do a brief overview. So Nat Turner was an enslaved African uh, who um, was taught to read by one of his many slave masters' sons uh, when he was a child. And so he got really into reading various religious texts. And over time, he uh, developed a sort of prophet complex and identified himself as a savior. And at the time in the South, you know, the sort of two to three million uh, poor whites that lived there along with the several hundred thousand uh, planter class, people who owned slaves, uh, the mythos at the time was that this was black enslavement was ordained by God and that black people were happy to be enslaved in the Americas because Africa was such a wretched land to come from. And so 
when Nat Turner's rebellion occurred and he took 75 Africans and they killed uh, within a few days, 60 people and it took a militia of 30, uh, 3,000 uh, to take them out, the response was very swift. And so this was the first time in which the South was confronted with the reality of you know, black folks actually not being okay with enslavement. So they responded by banning uh, or prohibiting educating uh, black folks in the South. This is all the way back in 1831, but if we just put it in the context only 70 years later, we get uh, the Rosenwald schools. And so um, during that time, so we get to the Civil War, what we actually see um, in the United States at the time prior to that was this big push for the common education movement. This actually is related to how Rosenwald came to the United States. So we talk about these pogroms. Um, you know, the US for a long time was fairly homogenous in a lot of its religious religiosity, right? We had a variety of Protestant uh, people living there. The most, pe uh, most people were still were Protestant, but you know, around the mid, well, I should say mid uh, 19th century, all the way up until about 1914, you had a mass migration of people from Europe, about 40 million people from left Europe, mostly Irish, but a lot of Jews left as well because of the restructuring efforts there. And this is where you had, you know, the Russian empire expanding into Ottoman territory. This is where these pogroms came. This was territory that was previously owned by other, uh, other civilizations. So that left uh, the Jewish populations alone, but once the Russians took over, they kicked them out. And when people came out of the United States, there was a big crisis about how, you know, how are we gonna educate all these new people who are Roman Catholics because they come from Ireland, and we have Jews who are coming from uh, both escaping the plight of Russia and Germany at the time. So how do we create a homogenous country? And the response was to create a common education movement to address the massive industrialized labor force that was being, you know, re was being introduced to the United States. And in fact, this is related to the Civil War because this was seen as the sort of, you know, the, the struggle in the US, which is, are we going to be this nation based on enslavement and settler expansion? Or are we gonna be a nation that's you know, based on industrialism and in an urban population. Um, and so the South was reluctant and had not really engaged with the common education movement at the time. So common education doesn't happen until prior. Uh, so when Rosenwald came up to build these schools, there is this, you know, this push to create a common education in the South, but this was in the wake of the ongoing fears of what it meant to educate the black population and what they would do with that education. So sort of the compromise in so many ways, um, as far as what it meant to educate and industrialize the South was to say, okay, we will um, we will allow for there to be education of both whites and blacks, but we'll do separate schools. And also only, only whites will be able to engage in the industrialization effort as far as becoming proletarianized and working in labor forces. And so what you had was even following enslavement in the mid or to late, mid to late 19th century, you had, uh, um, you had a series of uh, measures that were put in place to allow poor whites to benefit and proletarianize at the expense of black folks. So this was, you know, sharecropping, which was more or less a way of reintroducing the system of enslavement to the cotton economy, which actually expanded and grew following the Civil War. Then you had convict leasing, and then you also had, um, you also had debt peonage, right? This kept, uh, this kept poor black folks out of the labor force, and it kept them out of the same education circles that whites were uh, allowed to integrate into. So when Rosenwald was building these schools in the 20th century, I mean, I remember watching that, and that's, these aren't things that are necessarily mentioned in the documentary, but all I could think was like, man, okay, well, I can imagine people weren't too happy about this, because one thing the documentary isn't mentioning is they're true, not true, but there are real fears and concerns, and the documentary does mention a lot of how people responded to these schools and them burning down. But I thought it was, you know, it's useful to sort of bring up that that was because there was a legitimate fear that had sort of been sparked just a generation ago in the hearts of uh, white Southerners about a black insurrection and that education, knowledge being power was seen as a key to that. Um, so for me, I think when we get to the, when we fast forward to the 20th century and we're building these schools, uh, we were building, building schools under this backdrop. And I figured that was something that might actually, wasn't in the film that is, I think, worthwhile to mention and think about. So. Mm, thank you. That was a really wonderful, informative overview. Really appreciate it. So mm -hmm. let me, Stephanie, let's just turn to you and give you an opportunity to take some time and, you know, talk a little bit about your family background. I know you have your related by marriage to Julius Rosenwald and um, how you got involved in the film and maybe just, you know, say something about your thoughts about what Rosenwald accomplished. Thanks, Judy. Well, yes, I um, 20 or so years ago, I was looking for, I wanted to write a biography. And um, one of my husband's cousins suggested Julius Rosenwald. 
she, the cousin, and my husband are great grandchildren of Julius Rosenwald. And I knew that he was involved with Sears. Uh, and Sears was of interest to me because I grew up, you know, pouring over the Sears catalog and choosing my baby doll out of there. But uh, I didn't really know anything about Rosenwald. So I read the one existing biography at the time. And I found that the part of the story that interested me was less the business aspect, but the relationship with Booker T. Washington fascinated me in part because I really was very ignorant about a lot of that history. Um, you, you talked about my background. I, I had lived in Europe. I had studied Russian studies. I had never really focused on American history. And so I was riveted. Um, I knew the name Booker T. Washington. I knew the name Tuskegee, but I didn't, I didn't really know anything. And so I was fascinated by that. And I decided to focus my book, to focus my work on the two men and the schools. Uh, and I was lucky in that just at the time I was doing this work, the preservation movement to preserve the schoolhouses was gaining steam. The Rosenwald schools, of course, all closed after segregation ended at some, you know, within 10 or 15 years, uh, the schools closed and uh, in some cases passed into private hands, in some cases reverted to the county or the church that had originally owned them. And in some cases just kind of fell apart and disappeared. They were very rural. And, and um, so a, a preservation movement was gaining steam. And in 2002, the National Trust for Historic Preservation named the schools to the most endangered historic sites in America. So I'm working on my book. And uh, in 2010, I got my first invitation to visit a Rosenwald school. And it was the Scrabble School in Rappahannock County, Virginia, about an hour and a half from here. And it was my introduction, not just to the buildings, but to the incredible spirit and uh, the enthusiasm for the schools in the alumni. And uh, the Scrabble School has sort of an interesting story. A man who had gone to the Scrabble School moved away, had his career in Washington, DC. And then when he retired, moved back to the county. And he saw that the school had been shuttered and the county was using it as the municipal dump. And it was practically within sight of his house. And he decided that that's not right. We need to preserve this school. And by the time I visited the school, he had died, but his wife, his widow showed me around. I met with six women who had gone to the school and it was my introduction to the extraordinary affection and um, regard for what transpired in these schools that the alumni share. And I've, I've had the opportunity to, visit, to now visit with many alumni groups. And each time it's the same thing. They, ex they experienced, an inc they had an incredibly positive experience in the school. Many of them, there were large numbers of family members who were involved with building the school, giving the land for the school, many siblings and cousins going to the school, parents involved with fundraising. Um, and it was, it was an extraordinarily positive uh, positive environment. And so it's been, it, it's been very gratifying for me to be part of that as a, uh, as I visited the schools. Um, my book came out in 2011, which was a hundred years after Julius and Booker T had met. And shortly after that, I was contacted by Aviva because of the film she was doing. And of course I was thrilled to be involved with the film. And I was um, uh, also thrilled to meet Julian Bond, who it turned out has had a strong family connection with the Rosenwald Fund. Uh, his father had worked for the Rosenwald Fund, uh, uh, going to look at schools, checking on the schools, making sure they were uh, up to the standards. And then he received several Rosenwald fellowships as well. So. Uh, Julian and I shared a lot of sort of Rosenwald reminiscence. Um, just to address for one minute the relevance of Rosenwald schools, 
So this morning we all read in the paper about um, the nominee for Secretary of Defense is General Lloyd Austin III from Thomasville, Georgia. I just decided to Google, I couldn't get onto the FISC website, but I thought I'd just Google Thomasville, Georgia Rosenwald schools. Turns out there were six Rosenwald schools in that county and one has been restored um, and there's an active alumni association there. Uh, it's a story that touched a lot, a lot of people. Um, one more thing about the schools that wasn't in my book and I isn't mentioned in the movie, two economists from the Federal Reserve in Chicago did a study, a statistical study of outcomes from counties that had more Rosenwald schools as opposed to counties that had fewer Rosenwald schools. And they were able to discern positive outcomes in terms of higher rates of high school graduation, higher rates of college graduation, uh, lower rates of incarceration uh, from the counties that had more Rosenwald schools. So uh, it, it had a huge impact. It's a program that had an enormous impact. Thank you. So Julius, do you wanna, um, let's just delve into Booker T. Washington for a little mm -hmm. bit. And maybe Julius, if you wanna just, you know, in today, perhaps he is not the heroic figure that we think when we hear his name. Um, you wanna talk a little bit about him and then maybe Stephanie, you could just pick up the thread and talk a little bit more about the relationship between Julius Rosenwald and Booker T. Washington. Sure. Yeah, I mean, so I think today, at least I think what a lot of people think about uh, Booker T. Washington was oftentimes the, in the famous debate between him and W.B. Du Bois around what was called the Atlanta Compromise, which is you know where the Rosenwald schools are sort of embedded in the middle of this, which was um, this compromise that was signed off uh, by Booker T. Washington uh, to have black folks be educated uh, into trade programs in the South. And as a compromise, they would stop pushing for uh, racial justice and that they would accept the political domination of whites at the time. Um, and this was seen not just by W.B. Du Bois, although he was the most you know, vocal critic of uh, the Atlanta Compromise, as sort of a cop-out. Um, and what I find fascinating about this is in the film does mention Du Bois towards the end and they mention the infamous uh, com concept of talented tent. And I always, I find that to be interesting because, you know, the talented tenth is sometimes used to sort of critique Du Bois. And what I also find interesting, if you look up on Wikipedia, the Atlanta Compromise, there's this little snag in Du Bois where they try to say that he changed his mind and went back and forth. You know, that's sort of, that's, that's the human element here, right? Du Bois, when he was young, early on, did have this view of a talented tenth that he thought that there should be a, you know, a 10% of the black population that would be in the intelligentsia or be the rich merchants that we have in any you know, capitalist nation. And that's taken for some folks to think that Du Bois was essentializing that. But in fact, he did, his views evolved, but he was looking at how black folks can create a society of self-determination. So he looked at the uh, Atlanta Compromise that was established by Booker T. Washington as a problem. Now, if you look at Booker T. Washington at that time, I mean, him, you know, he's, I think he is really, in many respects, the debate that he has with uh, Du Bois is sort of setting the stage for the civil rights movement that happened down the road. I mean, a lot of what Booker T. Washington saw was the realities of white supremacy and a white supremacist uh, society and just how far black folks are going to be able to advance considering all the changes that had happened. And so Booker T. Washington's you know, sort of goal was to create the best conditions that were possible for black folks in the face of a white supremacist nation. Um, and so his criti the criticisms that he, he received was that his compromises ultimately were set up to integrate black people into the United States, but to do so at the cost of undermining their abilities for self-determination. And in many respects, one can make the argument that uh, you know, this criticism turned out in some respects to be true that you know, it's it's very it was very difficult uh, for Black folks to create and sustain uh, communities wherein you had a diversity of individuals operating in tandem and operating together. When we just look at the time, we look at issues surrounding segregation. I also think that it's worthwhile to mention that this has this narrative has a lot to do with our own mythos and how we talk about things. And so, for a long time, Booker T. Washington, even when I was a kid and I read about Booker T. Washington, it was, it was spoken about favorably. But I think as our views have evolved on segregation, we've looked at his 
uh, his role in the Atlanta Compromise is sort of instituting um, you know, segregation in the South. Um, and that follows this mythos that came you know, you know, decades later uh, in 1954, Brown v. Board of Education. Uh, and that is sort of universally, to some extent, understood as a good thing, as this was, you know, in, this was about integration, right? But there's been even pushback, and particularly uh, in critical race theory, to point out that, you know, Brown versus the Board of Education actually even further uh, entrenched or further removed uh, Black folks from the realities of self determination, because a lot of what happened during integration was a lot of Black teachers were left out of work. They weren't integrated into the schools. And it was actually actually another project of white supremacy. And so while I do see, I, and I understand the, the way history under, looks at Booker T. Washington's role in segregation as critical, I just think it's worthwhile to note that, you know, that narrative is still unfolding as far as what, you know, how we come to really understand the role and effects of education and how education was established. Um, and I always, like I've said before, and it's sort of like corny, but you know, knowledge is truly power. I, and I believe that to be true. And so I think that you know, having some type, having some type of structure of education in which you were able to have you know young black children educated by you know other black folks was really powerful and important at the time. And we haven't really told that full story, uh, and we haven't really you know looked closely at what was lost when we saw this massive movement towards integration. For anyone interested, this is the educator in me that can't help but do these references. So if you will bear with me, Malcolm Gladwell is a really great podcast who covers this issue quite well. If you're actually interested in learning more about sort of this revisionist or sort of this different understanding of Brown versus the Board of Education and the aftermath of that and how it is really truly being understood um, as a part of a broader project of white supremacy to sort of deny black folks the ability to educate themselves and to see their education as inferior to whites because they were being educated by black people. So it was a part of that same project. Um, so Booker T. Washington, um, you know, and his role in all of this is sort of been remembered as a criticism, but I do, and I still, and I think those criticisms are fair and valid, but I do think there is, you know, there's a lot that gets unsaid. that's not really said in those conversations as well. So. No, that, that's so interesting. And, and Stephanie, can you talk a little bit about the relationship between the two of them? Do you think they had conversations about segregation? And like, what did they talk about? Well, I wish I had been a fly on the wall for some of their meetings. Um, I just want to jump in and say, uh, in terms of what Julius was saying, that, you know, it was, it was W.B. Du Bois who used the term Atlanta Compromise. That was, that was his description of the speech. And I think um, Booker T. Washington's ultimate motivations were towards empowering Black people. And uh, I don't think that he, I think it's a little bit belittling of him to assume that he was just accepting inequality moving forward. I think, I think he felt it was a stage that was to be passed through and that the only way forward was through education. Um, but in any case, this is, as you say, this is, a, this is a discussion that basically is still being played out. We're still, we're still, we're, we're still having it. In terms of the relationship between um, Booker T. Washington and Julius Rosenwald, I think they had a very interesting relationship. They were actually rather similar kinds of men. They came from totally different backgrounds, but they were both very pragmatic. Neither one was uh, in any way sort of a philosopher, a, uh, you know, a, a Washington wasn't a deep thinker like W.B. Du Bois. He was a pragmatist. And uh, certainly the reason Rosenwald was such a success with Sears was he was a good manager. He made, he made the deliveries, uh, he, he made things come on time and people like that. Uh, so when they met each other, I think they were kind of impressed with each other. And, and um, one of the things that my, my friend Adele Alexander pointed out to me was that they each had sort of a place to show off to the other. The first time they met, it was in Chicago. And the day after they met, Rosenwald took Booker T. Washington out to, to Sears, which had this huge, very modern plant on the west side of Chicago. And he was kind of, I think, you know, showing off his place. So, so Washington said, okay, now you have to come down and visit Tuskegee. 
And uh, so in the fall of 2011, Julius Rosenwald filled a train, private train car with friends from Chicago and family. Uh, and they went down to Tuskegee and spent three days there. And they got to, then it was Washington's turn to show off. Um, and of course, any of you who've been to Tuskegee, you know it's a magnificent campus and the students had uh, built the, you know, the bricks, the very bricks that the buildings are made of were made right there by the students. Um, so they had a, they had a, um, I think they spoke the same language. Um, in terms of their conversations, I, I think I mentioned when we were talking the other day uh, that one of the most thrilling parts of my research was I was able to interview one of Julius Rosenwald's children, his youngest son, William, uh, Uncle Bill. Uh, and um, he, at the time I interviewed him, Uncle Bill was 93, he was very old, but he said he remembered when Booker T. Washington came to their house in Chicago, he was a boy of about eight or nine. And I said, gosh, well, what was that like? What, what was your impression? He said, well, I didn't really think anything about Washington, but I did wonder why he and my father spent such a long time in my father's office with the door closed. And uh, so we'll never know exactly what they were discussing, but we do know that the outcome was that Julius Rosenwald agreed to board, join the board of Tuskegee and uh, agreed to uh, take a small amount of the money he was donating to Tuskegee and use it to help six communities in the area right around Tuskegee build schools, schoolhouses. So while I've got you, Stephanie, perhaps, and then I'll, I'll go to another question, but talk a little bit about Julius's Jewish background, right? I mean, so did how, why did this propel him to do this kind of work? Yeah, that, that's, that's a good question. Um, Ju Julius was from a traditional uh, religious Jewish background. He had a bar mitzvah in Springfield, Illinois, and so he absorbed the Jewish teaching of Sadaka, um, giving that is based not so much on charity, the Christian concept of love. Uh, Sadaka is based on justice. Sadaka is based on a notion of if I have and you don't, it's my responsibility to help you. And it also is a concept of if I'm going to truly help you, I need to give you skills that will allow you to help yourself. And so Julius grew up very much in that, in that Jewish tradition. Uh, and then in Chicago, he went to Temple Sinai where the rabbi was Emil Hirsch, was a very powerful, uh, very well-known, uh, nationally known figure. And it, it, it's interesting to me, he was preaching a sort of, what Christian churches were hearing is the social gospel. Um, and in fact, he once said uh, that he had more in common with Unitarians than with Orthodox Jews. In other words, his, 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 uh, his faith was very focused on um, the world and, and doing good and, and promoting uh, a better society. And Rabbi Hirsch was a big influence on Julius. And he always said that he was one of his mentors and that he valued him. And on that first trip to Tuskegee, Rabbi Hirsch was one of the people who went down there with him. Um, the other thing about his Jewishness was, uh, I think Julius mentioned this earlier, he, he felt as a Jew, a, a, a great sense of identity with other, as he called it, despised minorities. He, he, uh, he understood what that was. And um, as Julia said, this is the time when American Jews are raising money to help victims of pogroms in Europe. And in one of his speeches, he said, we look down on Russians because of the way they treat their Jews, but we're doing something that's very similar to black people in this country. So he had a real understanding um, and a real, a real sense of, um, urgency about that. Um, you know, and of course, here we are in 2020. And here's what we do, what historians do, they always have to re-envision 
people, his, his characters, right? People who accomplish great things. But I think there is something that I, I want to lead us in a question about the role of philanthropy in fostering systemic change, right? You've got Julius Rosenwald. He made a lot of money. He wanted to give it away. He wanted to improve the lives of Black Americans, but he did not use his philanthropy to challenge the racial structures that had been, been constructed after Reconstruction, right? So he was a, he funded the schools. He avoided by by doing the, this great thing the risk of retaliation from white Southerners. They weren't going to come after him for doing this, and presumably his peers in the North were also pretty okay about them do, about him doing this. So it was, you know, maybe this is unkind, but it seems that it was a a safe way for him to be generous. Um, but do we have to have the conversation that he really um, enabled segregation because he didn't push against, he didn't use his money to push against segregation. He helped perpetuate segregation in the South. So I'd love both of you. Um, Julius, do you want to take that one on? And then uh, Stephanie, I'll turn to you. Yeah, I mean, so one, you know, one thing I actually, you know, I, I found rather admirable about Julius Rosenwald is that, you know, he, he really saw education as a way for, you know, Black folks in the South to truly, you know, lift themselves out, like to do something for themselves. Um, now, I think his vision was, you know, broad, and I think part of that was for further integration into the United States, and uh, particularly the United States as it was structured at the time. And I think that that's the sort of line in which we fault him on and say, well, like maybe that wasn't the best, best path to integrating uh, folks into the United States at the time because that sort of put them in segmented populations that relegated them to second class citizenship. Um, but I think that when, if you sort of just look at it a bit more abstractly, and I, I, mean, I, well, I think it's a, like, again, a fair criticism, and I don't mean to diminish that reality that you know, regardless of intent, the reality is that the schools that he built did contribute to segregation. But we have to ask ourselves again, like, you know, what was the role of segregation at the time? And oftentimes it, it similarly plays into this narrative that the, the one thing that was really holding uh, Black folks back was their inability to fully integrate into the United States society. And I would push back on that and say that I don't think that that's true. I think the one thing that was really preventing Black folks from integrating to US society is the one thing that prevented Julius Rosenwald from doing more, which is white supremacy, that he couldn't undo that. That was a that was a structure, it was an ideology that was seeped into the infrastructure of the South. It was actively being put into the South. And while it's not to say that money couldn't go towards undoing that, the reality of the circumstance, the reality of the conditions were that, you know, Rose, like Rosenwald to fight that under this form of integration didn't necessarily, if he would have fought it under this narrative of integration would have necessarily yielded the same types of results. I mean, you still had the great migration following this, and this was talked about in the film as well. And what happened when Black folks moved into Northern cities, they were seen similarly as a threat and they were actively responded to with hostilities. And I think that, so I think part of that, you know, and we we started this talk off and I really appreciated that with, you know, you know the fact that these schools helped folks like figures like Langston Hughes, right? This created spaces, created arenas for these kinds of conversations to occur. Yeah. Um, and I think that a lot, a lot, a lot of good came out of that. And I think that if we're judging Julius Rosewald on, you know, his support of segregation, I think a deeper conversation that maybe it's about time the United States has is like, what has historically been the role? How should we understand the role of enslaved Africans, because there's a fundamental difference between coming from Russia, escaping the plight, um, and having a migration coming from Russia, escaping the plight of Jews because of newly acquired lands and the treatment versus being forcibly ripped away from your nation and told to speak another language. And then you're going to work as a slave for the rest of your life. And then being told that, okay, you're not, we're not going to call you a slave anymore, but we are going to say that you still have to work for, uh, for the betterment of white folks the rest of your life because we created an ideology that said that you are actively inferior. I mean, that's, that's, that's really what we're up against. And I think that, I don't think that, you know, I, I'm always sort of, I'm, I'm interested in moving past this, is, this, is was sec separate but equal, you know, the, the end all be all evil, because I think the real evil is truly the infrastructure of white supremacy. And I think that, you know, again, it was admirable to fight against that. And I think that Julius Rosenwald was aware that if he did any more, he probably, they would have, people would have come for him on, 
not, wouldn't have been surprised. I mean, they burned down his schools. I found it interesting that some of his schools were burned down three times. I feel like that's rather telling that he was doing things that folks didn't like at the time. And, you know, he did respond accordingly and said, well, I'm going to keep, keep building these schools. Um, and so I think, again, we, we at the time, segregation was even common. It had just been recently out, abolished and even... <laughs> Massachusetts, right? It wasn't like it was just the South at that time, right? It was the North too that was similarly segregated. Um, and I think that, you know, education wasn't necessarily, like there was no, you know, light at the end of the tunnel that wasn't segregation, like segregationist perspective. That's what we have now. So that's the narrative we apply to history in the past based on what we have now. But part of the narrative that we're having right now is, well, here we are and here we are again with the same problem. So where are we? What, what have we really addressed? And I think that's the deeper discussion is that we haven't been successful. We've made really great attempts. There's a lot to learn from the great attempts that the United States has made to sort of address its history around the enslavement of Africans. Uh, but there's still a long road ahead because we clearly haven't solved the issue. Here, here. And I will just point out, there are comments in the chat that certainly are suggesting that, of course, you cannot judge. Um, he was a man of his time and to judge him by, by 21st century uh, values is, is really difficult. So thank you for those who agreed in the chat. Stephanie. Yeah, um, well, for one thing, uh, Julius Rosenwald wasn't just building the schools. He was a major financial supporter of the NAACP. He was on the board of the Chicago branch. And so he was supporting a range of um, programs and activities. He also was a big believer in investing in people. You know, he didn't build buildings, he didn't collect art, he didn't, he didn't do that. He, his investment was in people. And he invested in the Booker T. Washington version of what that means by educating, by helping communities create schools. He also invested in the, as, as uh, Du Bois called them, the Talented Tenth through the fellowship program that the second half of the movie uh, had wonderful, wonderful vignettes of different Rosenwald fellows. Um, that was a remarkable program that supported artists and uh, intellectuals, scholars, doctors, uh, an amazing, amazing range of people. Julius Rosenwald's conviction was that it is people who will take on and solve these systemic ongoing problems. And I think he, part of his modesty was he, he, didn't, he, he, he didn't assume that his way was the right way. He thought we will educate people and they will figure it out. It's, it's, the, it's, it's creating the, the soil, it's creating the, 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 um, the energy that will uh, deal with these issues. And uh, I, think, I think that's true. I also wanted to get to something Julius was alluding to about the loss that was experienced. Um, segregation, of course, had to end. Enforced segregation had to end. Integration was a good thing. But for communities that had built up really strong institutions like the Rosenwald schools, there was significant loss. And um, as Julius mentioned, teachers who had been you know, very capably, very capably administering a one through seven grades, one through seven school all by themselves, uh, uh, now are out of work or, or part of a system where they're way further down on the totem pole. And it, it's interesting, that was one of my um, realizations when I was doing something that I hadn't anticipated, I had never really thought about, I had, I, that, that, that was something I learned from, from experiencing the Rosenwald schools and the, the um, tremendous uh, affection that people had for their experience there. Um, we've got a number of questions from the audience and I want to get to those. So I'm just gonna ask two, two additional questions if I can. Um, you know, the, what the film was, it was the interviews in the film and the film clip, the historic clips that they were just, the film was so beautifully put together. And it was so clear the number of people who benefited by attending a Rosenwald school, John Lewis was speaking. Um, do you wanna talk a little bit about what you see the benefit for subsequent generations, those who, well, I, I think I mentioned this in, in when we were talking previously, but you know, someone like Barack Obama, President Obama, he, 
he was the generation that preceded the civil rights movement. So what, what has been the benefit for sub subsequent generations after the civil rights movement, the benefit from the whole Rosenwald School? Um, well, I, I think uh, people whose parents are educated grow up in a different environment from people whose parents are, are not educated. Uh, and the Rosenwald schools created in the South a generation, hel helped to create, they didn't, they didn't educate everyone in the South, but helped to create a generation of, uh, of people who were, who were educated. And, and um, I mean, I've, I've met several Rosenwald school graduates who told me my parents couldn't read or write. Um, so, you know, that obviously gives you a big advantage if you can uh, move on. In terms of Obama, uh, I don't know. Uh, I do know that Obama, when he lived in Chicago, lived very close to where Julius Rosenwald used to live. So, I don't know, maybe breathing the same air somehow <laughs> was a good influence. Julius, what do you think? Anything about the generation after the civil rights movement? And I mean, I, you know, I think that just this sheer, you know, fact alone that some that the people who went to that school have, you know, gone on to be prominent figures in the black community uh, in the United States. Like that alone, you know, that's been a, that's been a beacon of hope for, you know, black youth. I mean, just John Lewis as one individual, right? And I think his name is worth mentioning, you know, of of late, right? Because of what's you know, it's Maya been. Angelou also went to a Rosenwald school. So. And so that alone, I mean, and that and again, that's that's sort of the the, the ad the piece where I say that's, you know, admirable because I do think that we have to really put that into, we really take for granted what it means to have a whole population of millions of, you know, Black folks in the South that can't read or write. Um, and we also, you know, we, uh, we, uh, we undermine the significance of language here too. You know, this was, a, this is about language training too for some folks because, you know, we don't like to recognize the fact that enslaved Africans truly do speak a different language, right? Their English is not the same because their world experience is not the same as, a white folks are so you also educated them in language they were able to communicate we know Langston Hughes we, we know these things now because they can learn to read and write because black folks can read and write now we can record and have these things actually cemented in history so that was very important I do think and I think that you know have an entire population of people who are removed from a language that are removed from any kind of ability to document their history to now have that ability to document it is very important um, I mean I think the the effects of that are still unfolding. I don't think we have fully seen what you know what can the value of that. But you know, I can just say, um, from, you know, for me, like you know, James Baldwin is you know one of my favorite uh, writers of all time. I'm you know he's, I'm a really big James Baldwin fan, and I think he he's inspired a lot of my work, and he's inspired a lot of things I do. And so you know, people. You know, people just getting an education and being able to find their voice through the arena. I think the appropriate way to look at that is that this was a space that then people took advantage of and through those advantages we've seen the effects right and I think that just creating the arena in the space was really important and it's worthwhile to celebrate and to acknowledge yeah yeah thank you. the other thing the other thing that I um that I think is so important that we haven't really stressed is that the schools were created by the communities and that one of the attractions for Julius Rosenwald to this to to this program, which was essentially Booker T. Washington's idea, because he, he was attracted, Rosenwald was attracted to the idea of partnering with communities where people already, people who were not wealthy at all, were already putting aside money to build the schools. And I think that that, that, um, that was a big hook for him. Uh, he, he didn't want to be the rich guy, you know, handing, handing people a school. Uh, he wanted to partner with them, and that was a very strong, that was a very strong part of uh, his interest in doing it. And part of what the school created wasn't just the students; it created social capital in the community. It, it strengthened the people who worked to create the school, and and to maintain it, and to and to see it with pride. And I guess. I wanted to comment a little bit on that because something that came up in the film too, and I think it's worthwhile to contextualize what had also happened was that, you know, following, you know, the, uh, the Civil War, you had a lot of, you know, Black churches be developed, right? So a lot of, this was the first source for community for a lot of Black folks following right. the Civil War was to build their own churches that were away from uh, white churches. It was their own view. 
And one of the points that I made in the film was that, you know, when people graduated with straight A's, you would have cross communities, people in these churches who were, would applaud folks who did that. And that, you know, again, that shows that that led to a, an additional layer to social cohesion in those spaces. Because the, I mean, the prominence, I can't stress enough how important it was following the Civil War for so many different uh, uh, groups of uh, previously enslaved Africans to create churches for community. And then they have the additional layer of education. Th these are things that create resiliency, right? These are important foundations to any community that a community needs to retain knowledge and to have a respect and appreciation. And then to connect that across groups, right? So we, have, we don't have, need a shared ideology. We can have a shared form of celebration through education. That's very important. Um, and I thought that that was a, yeah, you know, it was a point that was sort of, I, don't, I wouldn't say it was glossed over, but it's something that I hung on to in particular. Yeah, I know, I totally agree. I'm gonna hold my last question because I'm looking at the clock and we have so many great questions from the um, from the audience. If you have a question, put it in the Q&A. Not sure we're gonna have time for everything. There's one quick question um, that a number of people have posed. Stephanie, you could probably take this one. Why did Rosenwald want the fund to sunset? Why did he want the fund to sunset? Yeah, that's interesting. One of the reasons that Julius Rosenwald's name is not well known is that he did not believe in perpetual endowments. He felt that uh, a fortune is created in a particular time and, and a donor has a particular vision of what he wants to do and that that's gonna get diluted over time. And so he set up his foundation to put itself out of business within 25 years of his death, which it did. So in 1948, the Rosenwald Fund closed its doors. Um, and that's, so, you know, there, there will be a Rockefeller Foundation until the end of time, but, um, but the name Rosenwald is not well known. Uh, he, felt, he felt that the needs of a particular time can be addressed by people from that time, but you can't, uh, you can't know what the needs of a future time will be. You can't, you can't um, anticipate that. And so that was that was his his view that it should all be expended uh, within his lifetime, uh, short shortly after his lifetime. Did you talk to his son about that, or his is that a conversation in the family why he would do that, or everybody accepted it as it was his his desire? Uh, that's an interesting question. I no, that's never come up uh, there. There are various members of the family where people have their own foundations, and I'm not sure what provisions they've made. Um, but I do think, uh, I do think more and more he is admired in philanthropic circles. Um, in fact, Philanthropy Magazine here in Washington about 10 years ago had a cover story called The Greatest Donor You Never Heard Of. And uh, increasingly, this is considered a, uh, is considered a good a good provision this sunsetting of foundations it so, gives you more money to spend for the immediate needs more money to address problems with and then you don't create a bureaucracy that's going to go on and on yeah that's good the film was um somewhat opaque about rosenwald's political leanings can was he where did he, you know, where was he politically? Was he a Democrat? Was he Republican? He was a Republican. He was a Republican, like Booker T. Washington. It's just um, so that they shared that. They shared that, yeah. Um, uh, it's funny, I've been asked, well, where, what would he be if he were with us today? <laughs> um, I, you know, he was a conservative guy in many ways. Um, I, I I don't know. Uh, it would be in, it, it'd be interesting to know. But yeah, he was a Republican. Um, I have a letter that he wrote to my father-in-law when he was a child from the White House. He was there spending the night uh, in 1929. Um, the Hoover it was Hoover inauguration, and uh, he said to my father-in-law, "Dear Dick." I thought you might get a kick out of getting a letter from the White House. You know, maybe I'll bring you here to visit sometime. So he was a major donor to the Republican Party. I love this question because I I want to know. Um, do you know um, how do you contribute if, to the recreation of the harp sculpture? I that was a oh um, well if you if you Google harp sculpture Aviva Rosenwald uh, Aviva Kempner, I'm sure you could find out. Yeah, she's passionate about that, and and it will be wonderful if it 
if it can happen. And did Rosenwald keep a diary, letters? Is there an archive somewhere? There's tons of letters. He didn't keep a diary. You, as a biographer, you really would love the real personal diary and neither Washington nor Rosenwald uh, kept that. But there are tons of letters. Um, there are a lot at the University of Chicago. Um, there are a lot at uh, Rosenwald's daughter, Edith, married um, Edgar Stern in New Orleans. And there's a lot of letters at Longview, their house down in New Orleans. Um, and Booker T. Washington, of course, all his, his papers are at the Library of Congress. Um, so I've, I've had a chance to look at them. Um, you always want more, you know, you, 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 you want the real, uh, the real personal stuff and neither man was very um, comfortable being self-revealing. Julius, do you want to say anything about Booker T. Washington and his polit political leanings or? I mean, I, I, some, I don't know. I mean, it's interesting, to, but the way I think about that question is the best answer for it is to put it in current political, in our current political terms. I mean, in our political context, I mean, what it meant to be a Republican um, and, you know, at the, at the turn of the 20th century um, means something very different now. I mean, there are still, you know, some, there's still continuity between those two parties, I think more than a lot of people like to realize um, as far as, you know, what the vision of the Republican party was um, for the United States. And so the extent to which I know anything about Booker T. Washington is that, you know, part of the vision, the broader vision of the Republican party was to create, you know, a, a larger, more robust, diverse economy in the United States. And so a lot of what Booker T. Washington saw is that black folks could play a very, you know, very, very strong role in that because the Republican party was, you know, interested, I mean, you know, just a few, during the time of all this, right, they built the Transcontinental Railroad, like they're really invested in, you know, creating trade between these groups. And so I, I know that that's where his politics lie. I don't know if that's in the same tone of what you want the, the answer to be, but that's just what I know about politics, sharing what I do know about it. So. I think that's really, I think that's really a good point, Julius. I, I, yeah, I agree. So 1954, Brown versus Board of Education. Um, we do have a question. Is there, are there any books, any literature that actually um, delves into the students and teachers at the Rosenwald schools after the mm -hmm. desegregation, the Supreme Court ruling? Yes, um, I'm, I'm familiar with two, uh, to one that hasn't quite been published yet, but um, one account of um, a particular county in Virginia and just exploring what happened in that county before and after. Um, I think the whole area of segregation and then the trans, the, 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 the um, change to after Brown versus Board is an understudied, underexplored area. Um, and there's lots more good work for historians to do. But I, I, I do know people who have worked on that, uh, are working on that in particular areas, you know, to document the experiences of particular, particular groups of students. And it was, you know, it, I mean, we're all familiar with what happened at uh, Central High School in, in Little Rock uh, and how awful that was for those kids. Um, this one, County in Virginia, actually, some of the students had very positive experiences. So, I mean, it was it was a mix, but I think there's a lot more work to be done, and it needs to be done soon while the people are still with us. I I want to comment on that, but it's a little bit less about books. But I just wanted to add this caveat, so I think it's worthwhile to sort of make this distinction here. When we look at the Brown v. Board of Education argument, I think part of the issue is not just to be critical of it because it advocated for integration, because I think integration is good, but integration how? And so when I keep saying it was integration under the, you know, under the guise of white supremacy, the first question is, well, why didn't you have white kids go to the school, the Rosenwald schools? Like, why would that not be right. something to do? Because um, right now what we keep hearing, uh, like what I think is an important part of advocacy and the Black Lives Matter movement in particular is like centering the voices of Black folks, centering that perspective. And that is something that the United States has been consistently reluctant to do. And that's embedded in how it, you know, went forth with Brown v. Board of Education, which in many respects, you know, some have even gone as far to criticize it as a political stunt because even it's unprecedented, even in its own time, right? It was a unanimous decision. The Soviet Union had just criticized the United States for its treatment of its black population when the United States tried to, 
you know, push back against China joining the UN because of the, their treatment of the Tibetan people. So there was a lot of political pressure in the United States to do something about its relations and with the, its black population. And like the fact that we tell that story the way that we like to tell it and we're still where we are now, I think there's a lot to be reconciled. So I just wanted to add those things. I know it's not directly on topic, but I think it's worthwhile to say. And I just, I just like to, to add that um, the Scrabble school did function for one year with white students. Um, uh, it, that when I had that first meeting there with the women who'd gone to the school, one of them was a white woman who had gone to the school. But you're right. In general, no, they didn't say let's 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 bring the white kids to the Rosenwald School. They, the white school was always considered better. And there is a question actually: um, Did Julius Rosenwald do anything to integrate uh, Sears, the workers at the store? That is a very interesting question. Um, he had an impulse to do it. He thought it would be a good thing and he got a lot of pushback. And I think that is one reason he diverted his, his interest in, in racial matters to his philanthropy. Um, we're, we're coming to the end, maybe just a couple of more questions if, if we can. And I think a lot of people are really questioning saying, I've never heard of him. I didn't know any of this. So, um, and there, you know, so many philanthropists, so many Jewish philanthropists, their names are just known, known, known. So perhaps to you, Stephanie, why do we know so, I mean, I think from the film, we learned he's self-effacing, he was unpretentious, he really kept under the radar, but he'd lived a, a long life. So, you know, what are your thoughts about why he's relatively unknown in the United States. Well, I think for the reason that we discussed before that his foundation is no more. I also think it's interesting, we refer to Rosenwald schools, but the vast majority of schools did not have Rosenwald in their name. They were called the Hope School, the Gethsemane School, the Short Journey School, but. Rosenwald wasn't in their name. And there were even people who went to Rosenwald schools who didn't know who Julius Rosenwald was. They did, they, um, some schools displayed a picture of him, but many schools, people didn't even know. So the schools themselves, important and significant as they were, weren't putting the name out. Um, uh, and of course, the business that he's associated with doesn't have his name either. And there's some, you know, he could have tried to change the name, but he didn't. Um, Sears, it was founded by Richard Sears and his partner, Alva Roebuck, and he kept that name. So everyone's heard the name Sears. Everyone knows that, um, but he didn't choose to put his name on it. He was, he was modest. He wasn't, you know, the story about the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago, to which he gave the founding gift of $3 million, the, they wanted to call it the Rosenwald Industrial Museum. And he then insisted, no, he did not, he did not want his name on it. And it wasn't only out of modesty, it was because he didn't want there to be an assumption that his family would support it forever. Um, and sadly now it's, it's going to have someone else's name. It's been- Oh, I didn't know that. I, I, yeah. I've had a number of people who have, are expressing their just love of the film and said, oh, I only knew the Museum of Science and Industry as the Rosenwald Museum. As the Rosenwald Museum, yeah. A lot of people in Chicago still call it that. Exactly. Julius, I don't know, do you have any other, any thoughts about Rosenwald's legacy? Um, I mean, I'll admit that until I was uh, asked to be a part of this, I, his name was not known to me. I mean, I didn't know who he was. And so I did a lot of homework and learned a lot about him. Um, but I find, I, I still, I find those things really fascinating in particular, just just from my personal response to it, like, you know, in the United States, the fact that it seems like ripe to focus on someone, he was, you know, a very wealthy person associated with, a, you know, a very prominent company in the US. I mean, his name isn't Sears, but even the fact that he kind of took it over after Sears is odd to me, but just those facts are odd that we don't focus on him for those reasons, but not to mention then the things that he did. I mean, um, I mean, when we, we live in a nation that celebrates, you know, men like Thomas Edison, but we don't celebrate Julius Rosenwald, that's interesting to me. So yeah, I, I found that fascinating and perhaps history will change and we will start remembering people like that. But yeah, I don't know. Um, it is always odd how we, who we choose to remember. 
when uh, when Rosenwald died in 1932, uh, it was the headline was above the fold on the front page of the New York Times, and it said Rosenwald dead, nation mourns him. Hmm. He was quite well known at the time of his death, hmm. um, but has has drifted out of public view. No longer now. No every, longer because listen to your most erudite discussion this evening, I think has, has benefited enormously. Thank you both. Thank you, Stephanie. It's, it's late. Um, <laughs> far, and um, I just want to thank you both so much. Thanks to the Federation for doing the technology of tonight's event. Thanks to all our co-sponsors. What a wonderful, wonderful evening. And I hope that we're going to have an opportunity to um, be with both of you again. I'm sorry we didn't get to all the questions in the chat. I'm hoping we can save the chat and perhaps um, answer some of those questions offline. Thank you, thank you. Thanks to everyone for attending. Good night. Good night. Thank Good you. night, Julius. It was fun to chat with you. Likewise, likewise. Awesome. The Bye. chat, everybody in the chat is saying thank you, thank you, thank you. So. Well, Judy, you, you did a great job. It was, um, it was an interesting conversation. It was, yeah. Okay. Right. Thank you so Bye -bye. much. Bye. Good night.